Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for being with us today. Uh, I have introduced you Professor Oliver Wright from the Division of Applied uh, Physics uh, of the Faculty uh, of e Engineering in uh, Hokkaido University in uh, Japan. And uh, Professor Wright will uh, talk about acoustic metamaterial wizardry. Professor Wright, please. Yeah, thank you very much. So, uh, hello, hello everyone, and thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation. So, I'd like to start with a quote from Arthur C. Clarke, who you may know is the famous science fiction writer. And uh, he wrote A Space Odyssey 2001, which was made into a movie. And he said that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So today, I want to talk about some phenomenon, phenomena in acoustics that really do appear to be magic. Things like uh, invisible walls, talking to fish, and coffee tables that don't wobble in an earthquake. Uh, but I hope that I'll be able to convince you that these things are not magic are, and are in fact actually science after all. So if you have any question or comment during this presentation, please feel free to interrupt because, well, no one else is in this room and it's very informal and you don't need to worry about interrupting me because you won't put me off. So if you do have a question then that's urgent, please just fire away at any time. So, okay. So Hokkaido University. Hokkaido University looks a bit like this this time of year. And this is the, in fact, the Faculty of Engineering. And this window is my office. So if you happen to be in the vicinity, we're far, far up north in Japan, and we're very hospitable, so please drop in and say hi in that case. So I would also, I mean, like to acknowledge that this work is a joint collaboration between Hokkaido University and Yonsei and Ihua Women's University in Korea. So many thanks to these colleagues. And so, after giving a brief overview of acoustic metamaterials, I'd like to talk about four different topics that are listed here. Okay, so, acoustic metamaterials. Well, to make a metamaterial, you need oscillators whose size is small compared to the wavelength of the waves passing through them. The first proposal for an acoustic metamaterial under that name was made by Professor Ping Sheng's group at the Hokkaido University of Science and Technology. Sorry, at the Hong Kong University, it begins with H, sorry. The Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. So here is their uh, structure, which you see is made up of 10 millimeter lead spheres embedded in a soft material, which is rubber, and then surrounded by a hard material, which is epoxy. So each lead ball can oscillate it in its own cavity. The lattice constant is 16 millimeters, and they sent waves of about one meter through, a wavelength through there. And when they looked at the amplitude transmission coefficient of the acoustic waves, a function of frequency, they found that at 400 hertz, there was a huge damping the waves couldn't pass, which we refer to as a band gap, an acoustic band gap. So acoustic band gaps are an important characteristic of metamaterials. This example is of a 3D structure, um, but uh, 2D structures are called metasurfaces, and a unit cell would be called a metaatom. So to explain the detailed theory of acoustic metamaterials is very complicated, but I'd just like 
to summarize some important um, relevant points uh, for this talk. Um, yes. So, I particularly would like to explain the concept of effective mass. So, this is, first I want to illustrate this, but the case of a rolling cylinder of radius r and mass m, popular in undergraduate physics. I may, you, may, you may have done this, you surely have done this. Uh, if you do the sums, you find that the acceleration is given by the applied force, the component of the gravitational force down the slope, divided by the mass multiplied by 1 plus the moment of inertia divided by mr squared. Okay, so um, we can define an effective mass um, by the applied force, F, divided by the acceleration. And um, that is defined by here, which will give you this quantity greater than M. The, the acceleration, in fact, depends on the net force on the mass, which is the sum of the applied force and the frictional force FH, which is, in this case, is oppositely directed. So I refer to the frictional force here as a hidden force, as a hidden force. It's just a name, uh, the part that's not applied. And if you compare the two expressions for acceleration from this equation and this equation, it allows you to write the effective mass in this form, which is the mass divided by 1 plus the ratio of the hidden force to the applied force. So a plot of the normalized effective mass against the ratio of the hidden force to the applied force, or if you like, the external force, shows that depending on the sign of the hidden force, we can get any value of effective mass we want. So the effective mass can be infinity here, when the hidden force is minus the, fo the applied force. And the effective mass is zero when the applied force is zero. Um, that is when the hidden force, sorry, here, effective mass is zero when the hidden force is much greater than the applied force, here or here. So you can get it what, whatever you like. You get very huge ones or very small ones. But a, generic, um, a more generic example is a single oscillator, shown here as a mass connected to a wall by a spring. Here we can apply a sinusoidal force, um, an F, and consider what happens. Um, so, what happens in this case? So, here we, you see there's also a hidden force, which is the spring force. And standard analysis gives the frequency dependent hidden force, like, there, like this. And it's dependent on the resonant frequency omega zero and the applied sinusoidal frequency omega. And the effective mass is given as before, and it turns into an equation m multiplied by one minus omega zero squared over omega squared. So you can calculate the, if you want, the, the acceleration and displacement from this type of approach. Of course, you can do it your favorite way, but this is just one way of doing it. So if you plot this um, as a function of normalized frequency, the ratio of the effective mass to the actual mass, you see that low frequency, we have a large negative mass. On resonance, we have zero effective mass. And at high frequencies, we have normal behavior. So you can get quite a lot of interesting um, normal behavior, interesting things. And if you, sorry, I went too fast. Uh, normal behavior here, yeah. And then when you want to make your own meta atom, you can do it like this. So this is a, a heavy mass inside, uh, connected by springs inside a, an acrylic sphere. And if you hold this in your hand and shake it, it feels weird. And uh, that's because it's not behaving like an ordinary mass. 
So that's what an acoustic metamaterial is. It's something that's giving you forces you don't expect. But it, you, it will take you a long time to make this metamaterial ball. So I recommend if you're in a hotel, just get your phone. And the phone in a hotel looks a bit like this with a wire hanging off it, okay? So what you do is you take, you take maybe part of the cord like that in your hand, and then you take the receiver, and then you, vest, you just oscillate it at very low frequencies. That's what it feels like a negative mass. Actually, it's like a spring. So it doesn't feel like a mass at all. It feels like a spring. And then if you oscillate it very, very fast, at high frequencies, it will feel like an ordinary mass because it has a lot of inertia and the spring will be irrelevant. But then if you find the resonant frequency, which you can do by, you know, shaking it up and down a bit, and if you, if you find that frequency and you just resonate at that frequency, you'll, you'll see what it really feels like to have a zero effective mass. Maybe it will feel like a feather or something. There's one caveat is that you need to find a system with zero damping and this I'm afraid the, the telephone in the hotel won't 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 give you zero damping but anyway that's the closest thing otherwise you have to make this ball which is quite complicated to make okay so it's online I'm so sorry so a more complicated mass spring metamaterial one important property of the Hong Kong metamaterials was damping owing to the uh, opening of a band gap. So here's an animated version of a 1D metamaterial with a mass within a mass, just like I showed you. At the top, the top at high frequency and at the bottom, uh, sorry, at the top at low frequency at the bottom at high frequency, the waves pass. But if you go into the metamaterial band gap, the waves are heavily damped. So, which is a very useful effect if you have noisy neighbors and metamaterials. So, metamaterials are very good damping materials, and I want to come back to this later on in the talk. So, I'd like to come to the next part book to do with extraordinary airborne waves. So, uh, this is where you like this slide, I think, but now you get to see it again. So, cats can't catch mice which go into small holes, and that's obvious. But what about waves? Well, Bethe in 1944. Uh, updated by Camp in 1954, solved the diffraction problem of light with a wavelength much larger than the radius of a hole. And the transmission coefficient was found to go down, well, was calculated to go down as the fourth power of the radius divided by the wavelength. So it becomes very difficult to get long wavelength waves into short holes. However, in 1973, Ulrich showed that a copper metal grating with a period of 100 microns can perfectly pass EM electromagnetic waves of wavelength 300 microns owing to guided resonances in the, grate, in the, uh, in the mesh called Zenic surface waves. But in fact, this work remained unnoticed until about 1998 when Thomas Ebsen's group showed the same thing applies to visible light with a wavelength exceeding the aperture size, which was a surprising thing. And this was based on plasmon resonances in arrays of sub-micron holes in silver films, thin silver films. So more light passed through them than expected based on the fraction of the open area owing to these surface plasmon resonances. And the term was, that was given to this phenomenon was EOT, in other words, extraordinary optical transmission. So it, it's based on sub-wavelength object resonances, and so it's basically a metamaterial effect. So then, in, nine, in 2007, a similar effect was observed in acoustics by the Hong Kong group in collaboration with Wuhan University, 
And we can call this E80 instead of EOT. So we replaced the optical part by the acoustic part. And they did a megahertz experiment in water with a two millimeter thick plate of brass drilled with a square lattice of roughly one millimeter diameter holes. And they found that EAT was caused by fabry perot resonances in the holes. And to quantitatively describe this phenomenon, they needed some kind of figure of merit. So how are you going to describe it, how well it's transmitting? Well, they defined this thing called ETA, which is the transmission efficiency, which is the intensity transmission divided by the filling factor. So with only 30% of the area open, they still got 90%. That's roughly three times more energy through. So ETA is roughly three. So that's where my work comes in. And I collaborated with Yonsei University and Iwa University in Korea using this structure in front of you. It's a hole in a plate covered with a very thin membrane. And this hole is 17 millimeters in diameter and the plate is five millimeters thick and it's aluminum. And the membrane, surprisingly enough, is standard kitchen wrap, which is only 10 microns thick. So, just for a minute, I'd like you to consider an acoustic metamaterial wall made of a lot of these membrane covered holes in an array like this. So, if you consider it, it's just an oscillator, but what is oscillating? What is oscillating is the membrane and a plug of air around it. It entrains air with it. Whoops. And uh, if you apply Newton's second law to this plug of air, you get the force from the pressure difference and the surface area, which is the surface area of the hole, minus the spring force is equal to the acceleration times the mass of the plug of air plus the membrane. This is the acceleration. Psi is the displacement. And so, if you want to calculate just the applied force by the way, the reason that's colored in blue here is because this is the hidden force. You may have suspected that. Blue is hidden. So the applied force is just hidden force minus the hidden force minus this term, which you put in because it's sinusoidal excitation. And this must be equal to the effective mass times the acceleration, because that's how we define the effective mass, because this is just the apparent force, the applied force. And on resonance, this thing and this thing become equal and it equals zero. So it means on resonance, the effective mass is zero, which I already said once. And so it means that the pressure difference has to go to zero. And if the pressure difference is zero, acoustics tells you the transmission has to be equal to one. So that's, well, very surprising, isn't it? So, yeah. And uh, this guy also seems to think it's pretty surprising and pretty interesting. This is John Jing Park, the first author of the paper that we wrote, and he's sitting in front of his apparatus. And you can see here his waveguide, which is just an acrylic tube of diameter 10 centimeters. And in contrast to electromagnetic waveguides with conducting walls, the different boundary conditions for acoustics apply, imply that an acoustic waveguide can support longitudinal airborne waves of wavelength much greater than their diameter. And here we choose a wavelength about 30 centimeters. So the loudspeaker is up here. And you see you can measure the reflection and transmission from this aluminium plate with a hole in it. Where's some plasticine to keep it airtight and this is called the standard impedance tube measurement in the in the jargon and you can see here is an anechoic terminator made of porous material so how about the results so we first tested the transmission characteristics of a one hole disc using this setup with an aerial coverage of three percent which is the filling factor 
And this is the power transmission against frequency. When the hole is open, you hardly get anything through. Only 8% of the sound intensity gets through. But when you install the membrane, you get almost 80% transmission, which is incredible considering there's so much, not very much of the space is open. And the reflection power was reduced from a value of nearly 100% reflection to almost 1% by the use of this membrane installed in the hole. And if you calculate the efficiency, it's about 27, which is pretty great um, compared to all the other experiments that came before. So I just should mention the Q factor is about 11, and it's almost entirely governed by the geometry and not, and not by the membrane damping. So this effective Q factor of here. So it's a certain bandwidth where you get this happening. Now, it's interesting because this kitchen wrap, which is used for this membrane, is a, a household item. You might think it's quite easy to do this experiment. But I want to make you a, a word of warning if you want to try this experiment at home. So, actually, you need a special brand of kitchen wrap to make it work well. This is called Uniwrap. And I don't know how many of you can read Korean, but it says... Sun Shik Mu Song Chomga Tauk Han Han Chon Han Yuri Pek, which means kitchen wrap with ad vegetable additives. So I have no idea whether you can get this to work in Europe or not. I suggest you buy it from Korea direct. Okay, so how about uh, something that's not circular in cross-section. Because we want to make a metamaterial wall like the theory promised earlier. So here's a piece of plastic with 8.5 millimeter holes. You can see them spaced there over a 35 by 17 centimeter area. And you put that in a duct. And then you get a microphone and you painstakingly measure the acoustic pressure distribution with a kind of imaging on the cross-section of the duct. I tell you, it's a terribly long experiment. And okay, the top row is the pressure when you have no wall, so you just see the waves going from left to right, okay? And on the left here you have the wall with holes but no membrane. So you've got the waves coming in, they mainly get reflected and a tiny bit transmitted. And it doesn't matter what angle you put, sorry, you put the membrane, you're going to get this reflection and its interference pattern. But if you put the membrane, lo and behold, what do you see? Nothing. The wave seems to go through completely as if the wall is invisible, just like magic. Actually, the transmission is about 80%, but the color scale doesn't show you that. But anyway, it looks better like this. And needless, needless to say, this kind of wall won't be very good if you have noisy neighbors. So this is the opposite case of what I mentioned before. OK, so just a comparison of our results and some other people's results. So in the guys in optics, I put it in green. Sorry to say, it's pretty damn bad. And uh, their efficiency is like two, two or five or something. But in water, you can get, you know, two, three, eight. But our best result with a filling factor of 1% was 57. So that's pretty good. So that's not bad. Okay, but you, maybe you are blinded a bit by the science. So what I should explain to you now is how does it really work? So an intuitive description of the operating mechanism. So here you have the wave coming from the left. And you have a wall. And what's going to happen if you have a wall? You're going to just get 100% of the energy reflected. But now you're going to put the membrane in the, in the wall. And it's zero effective mass membrane is going to give you, did you see that? A wave at 180 degrees out of phase, which cancels out the incident wave. It also emits in the opposite direction the same amplitude. And so effectively, it gives you 100% transmission. That's all. 
So you could say an EAT element is a phase shifting reflector and a forward emitter. So it's not really magic after all. Um, so you're still not convinced, so I'll show you a simulation, then you'll be convinced. Okay, this was kindly given to me by Unbok, who's a postdoc in our group now, and he did some console simulations of, of the very experiment you saw the photograph of earlier. So here you have no membrane case. So a lot of the energy is reflected, almost standing waves and a little bit of transmission. But then with the membrane, okay, almost invisible wall. But what we missed in our scanning experiments in the imaging was the very, very near field phenomena in the region of the tiny membrane here. So you do see the pressure, the acoustic pressure is affected, but only very locally. We just missed that because we did a rough scan. So we look, made it look like real magic when we published that paper, but actually I'm showing you that it isn't really magic. And I did mention to you that the pressure was going in antiphase to the, the membrane motion, and that's how you get a reflected wave to cancel out the other wave. And you can see very clearly that's the case. The membrane is moving opposite to the implied pressure here. And if you're interested, there's also velocity field here. Okay, so I better carry on because there was an interruption and uh, I better speed up. So next su subject is a similar thing, but in solids, okay? And actually it's not experiments, it's simulation but it's still very interesting. And I need to just review a bit of the background of this subject because there's a, a, an, an, an added twist. An added twist is that you can, you can do sort of decorative things to your surfaces to get the waves to go through better. So these guys, um, Thomas Edison's group, proposed the bullseye. The bullseye, as the name suggests, tries to get to the target. So all these grooves, they made some grooves in a nanoscale silver film. All these grooves serve to get the resonance of the surface plasmons, which helps the light go through this tiny hole of diameter 250 nanometers. So um, what I want to say is that they found again a resonance at a wavelength in the visible. They also found, because the grooves were on the front and the back, collimation at the back. Similar things was found in acoustics, but with simulations this time, by a group from Madrid and Zaragoza in Spain. They proposed in air to have a solid barrier with grooves on, on both sides. And in this case, things called the acoustic surface waves, which also um, of some parallel with what are known as the sometimes called spoof acoustic waves, but they're a surface confined wave, will be help the resonance and enhance the transmission. And they got an effective, uh, an efficiency of 70. And this was calculated and collimation as well. So this is very interesting. But could this phenomenon also work in a solid itself? And this question was answered a couple of times already before this study we did. Um, Johan Christensen found that, that you could get extraordinary transmission for shear waves. We found you could get extraordinary transition for surface acoustic waves, but the efficiencies reported weren't any better than 20. So it's not very good. So we decided to try for the very first time bulk longitudinal acoustic waves. And we take two half spaces of tungsten in our simulation, joined by a wire, okay, circular cross section. And we see what happens when you put a plain acoustic wave from the left, a uh, bulk longitudinal acoustic wave on the left, and try to transmit to the right with different geometries here, with or without grooves. And the question we'd like to ask is, can longitudinal waves get through the wire to the right-hand half space? And then, is EAT possible with longitudinal waves in solids? And this is tungsten because it's a nice material which is isotropic. It's quasi-isotropic, even if it's a crystal. And actually, we chose dimensions to be in the nanoscale because this experiment could be done on the nanoscale and be used for interesting nanosensors. 
So we're talking about a nanowire of diameter 5 nanometers and length 40 nanometers. So the first thing to do was use PZ Flex, which is a, a very good finite element software, to make movies of the plane waves arriving on this nanowire and see how it's transmitted. You can see the waves are transmitted very nicely here for a wire of length 40 nanometers and diameter 5 nanometers. Of course, you could say 40 centimeters and, and uh, diameter 5 centimeters. It's, everything is scalable. What can you see here? You can see these funny waves coming on the outside and inside surfaces. These funny waves have a, have a slower sound velocity. These funny waves are surface acoustic waves. They're analogous to the surface plasmons they used in the optical experiments. Very, very analogous. And you can see here, because we're plotting dilatation, you won't see any shear waves generated, but you'll see the spherical radiation here of longitudinal waves. Okay, so we need to calculate the efficiency. I won't bore you with the details, but we have to take the Fourier transform for each frequency, and we use analysis regions, and we, we correct for the factor um, concerning the, the width of our source, and we can find the efficiency very accurately because we're only following a single mode. We, we ignore the, the, the little bit that's the surface waves. We're just focusing on the longitudinal waves. And let me remind you that, sorry, that E, that uh, let me remind you that EAT occurs when the efficiency is greater than one. So look for any efficiency greater than one and you have extraordinary acoustic transmission. So these are our first results. A uh, bit disappointing. We get, at least we get resonances, which is what we expect. These are organ pipe resonances, as it were. They're just like a laser cavity. It's an integral multiple of the sound velocity divided by twice the length. And uh, we, therefore we get n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3 resonances. And you can see the number of nodes increases with n. And what is disappointing is that the efficiency is only 1.6 at the best, in the best case, which is 50 gigahertz. That's not very good. So back to the drawing board. But before we go back to the drawing board, I just wanted to discuss a little bit the frequency of the resonance because it's interesting because you know about organ pipes uh, i don't know whether you learned this in high school or something but the resonance of an organ pipe as i said goes by this simple equation where it's an integral mul multiple the frequency is integral, integral multiple of the velocity divided by twice the length but the length has to be corrected by two end corrections because air vibrates outside the end of the organ pipe and in organ pipes in air you correct by 0.85 of the radius. And we found that in solids, in our case, we have to correct by 1.2 of the radius. That's all. So our graph shows 1.2 here. The only theory you could compare is this frictionless contact, which gives a similar value, but a bit higher because um, it's not so stiff if you have frictionless contact. Of course, we have embedded ends, so it's not frictionless contact at all. And the velocity of the waves we're talking about is about 4,330 meters per second in this nanowire thing. Okay, so, okay, that's the principle. And uh, the other interesting thing I should tell you is the Q factor. So the Q factor we get is, is 14, okay? Frictionless contact theory gives 65, but we have a lot of shear waves generated, which you can't do in frictionless contact. So that's probably why we don't get the same as the theory predicts, which is 65 and we get 14. Just to make a comparison with organ pipes for the same aspect ratio, well, the same ratio of, of the wavelengths to the radius, it's 86. You know, if your organ pipe didn't resonate, it wouldn't sound great, would it? If you heard, you know, one fugue, fugue for an organ by Bach or something, you want it to have a high Q factor. So anyway, so a solid organ pipe is pretty, pretty lousy. Don't think you could hear nice music on a solid organ pipe. Okay, so since it was a pretty bad um, efficiency, so we have to optimize the geometry. So we have a lot of optimization parameters to play with here, and uh, we're going to try and vary them all. I'm not going to list them, but you can see them listed here in the picture, and we're going to find the best values and see what the, the, uh, the best is. And here is the movie for the best case. It looks like the previous movie, okay? But there are grooves here on the front side, only on the front side. You can see the grooves 
Can you see the grooves? Here they are, the grooves, okay? And, uh, okay, this is in the time domain, so you're not going to see any resonance, but I'll show you later in the frequency domain. But uh, just to show the transmission efficiency as a function of the frequency, lo and behold, our efficiency has gone up to 500, which is remarkable. It's really large. And that's using 10 grooves with optimized parameters. Why is it so good? Because we adjusted the first resonance of the groove spacing to the first resonance of the fabric perro resonance of the wire. So that's why it works so well. If you include ultrasonic attenuation, you get some decrease in efficiency. But at low frequencies, if you do this experiment, you don't expect ultrasonic attenuation to be important. And so you really can get an efficiency of 5,000. Okay, so I like to give you a simple explanation of these things because it looks a bit, you know, I fangled. So let's consider a television aerial. A television aerial is very similar to the grooves here. Um, a television aerial consists of a, a radiator, some, some bars that produce interference, and a reflector. And so this is called the Yagi Uda antenna, works at 150 megahertz in the electromagnetic spectrum, two meter um, wavelength, and it sends a, a wave in one direction very nicely. Although it's not the exact analog, our grooves are doing something very similar. They're an acoustic antenna collecting the energy and sending it through this pipe. That's why we get this decent efficiency. Okay, so you're all wondering what happens if we put grooves on both sides. This is a comparison of that case. No grooves, grooves on one side, and finally grooves on both sides. You get high ET and of course you get the expected collimation. I'll show you in the next slide, it's even more clear. So here is grooves on both sides, you get collimation. So it's identical to what they observed in optics and calculated for acoustics of water. So that concludes that part of the talk. And I'd like to go on to acoustic metasurface for water to air transmission, which is surprising enough, very related to all the other stuff I've been talking about. So how about communicating with underwater life? Wouldn't you like to talk to him, this creature? Here are you people on the boat. They're trying to talk to this seal. But what happens? Can we hear sound in air generated underwater? No, we can only hear 0.05% of the original sound power because of the huge impedance difference. And if you want to calculate it, you use an equation like this, acoustic impedance of air, characteristic specific acoustic impedance of air minus specific acoustic impedance of water divided by the sum. And because water has 3,600 times more impedance than air because of its density and sound velocity, only 0.05% of the power is transmitted. So that's pretty hopeless. So what are we going to do about that? Well, why, why would we want to listen to underwater sound anyway? I mean, okay, listening to seals is one thing, but there are other reasons. The sensitivity of underwater sound detectors is relatively weak because piezo-based detectors have to be used, and that's the water mass to be moved. And if you look at the, a list of hydrophones and a list of microphones, hydrophones always produce much smaller voltages than, I mean, have much smaller sensitivities than microphones. So wouldn't it be nice if you could get an anti-reflection coating at the water-air interface and stick a microphone there, then you could listen to the fish with a higher sensitivity. It means you would save a lot of money on your amplifiers. And in, yeah, you could hear the happy voices of the fish. Would be nice. So um, everybody will say, okay, well then that's easy. I mean, they do that in medical ultrasonics and they also do it in optics. Just put a quarter wave anti-reflection coating on, just like you do in a camera lens. And you just choose the right refractive index for, for, the, for, for the layer. And there it is. And you, bingo. But what about water air in audio acoustics? Not good because we have a suitable natural material for anti-reflection coating. And also, even if we did, the wavelengths are large in air. I mean, it's like 30, 50 centimeters or something. 
So even Lambda by 4 would be a great thick layer like that. It's not really convenient. So, as you know, you knew the answer. Use a, an acoustic meta surface. So how are we going to design our meta atom? So here's our water, air, and our water, and here's a virtual interface. Well, it's just fun to consider an interface that doesn't exist at the distance of L from the water-air interface. This is the incident wave. Okay, you can go from air to water, you go from water to air. The thing is reciprocal. And uh, we're going to calculate the reflected power. The Z here are just a slightly different from the previous Z I mentioned because they're they are normalized to the area of the waveguide. This is a waveguide. It's called the acoustic impedance, not the specific acoustic impedance. And if we define the specific acoustic impedance of this at this virtual interface by the pressure divided by the volume velocity, we can do an analytical calculation of it. And here it is. Sorry for all the equations. But the ratio of the impedance to air, that of air is shown here for the real and imaginary parts of this ZL thing. This ZL, the reflections once you know ZL. And if you go away slowly from the water surface until you get at the distance of about one four hundredth of the wavelength, lo and behold, the impedance ratio for the real part is equal to one. That means it's the same as air. That means there won't be any reflection as concerns the real part. But no, 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 the imaginary part is still there. Uh-oh. And that imaginary part is not just a little bit. It's a lot. It's 60 times the impedance of, of, uh, of uh, it's actually negative, and 60 times as big as the impedance of air. So there's no way you're going to get anti-reflection with nothing. I mean, you knew that anyway, because if you put nothing there, you don't expect to change anything. Well, that's obvious. So what are you going to do? Well, we're going to put, this is the idea. We're going to put a sliding mass at this position where the virtual interface was. It's going to be a frictionless sliding mass. OK, there's no such thing. But just for the sake of argument, I want to consider a sliding mass here. And then you do the sums, and you find that at this magic distance away that I mentioned, the 400th of a wavelength, you can get the imaginary part of the impedance to go to zero. It means the impedance seen by a wave coming past this interface is the same as air. Doesn't matter what happens after that. If it's going through there, it means there's no more reflection. This is the beauty of this approach. It's known in acoustics, this impedance approach. And this special condition happens if two matching conditions are satisfied. The first I told you, that the distance has to be about a 400th of the wavelength. The second is you can find the value of the mass. It's about 10 times the wavelength times the cross-sectional area times the density of air. So it's the, it's the mass of air in 10 wavelengths. It's quite a big mass. OK, it's air, but it's still a big mass. Now I'm going to tell you how we're going to make it a frictionless sliding mass. We're not going to stick a plate of steel in there, and we're not going to put oil around it. We're going to use a membrane with a mass stuck on the membrane instead. It, it moves laterally very nicely, so it's good. And that's what you see here, except we use some a special hybrid membrane system, like it has five membranes. It also has the cavity because we need this distance L I told you about. And to stop the water getting in, we put another membrane, but that doesn't influence anything. And we choose the frequencies for these two membranes, which are in the range of 500 or 4 kilohertz. And once we've chosen those, we calculate our impedance and we find we get our magic number of imaginary impedance at a frequency of 700 hertz. That's the matching frequency. And if you're interested, the effective mass of this membrane is not zero at this magic number frequency. It's very large. So here we have uh, something very contrasting with the previous EAT example where you needed to get uh, a zero mass effective mass to get the, the thing to transmit here you need a very very heavy mass to get the thing to transmit because you're going from air to water here you're not going from air to air and the effective mass is actually 20 times the mass that you stick on here it turns out okay i'll tell you a bit later how much that is and if you want to know what it looks like when it's vibrating near this re regime where it's working in fact 
This is where the mass goes to infinity for zero losses. You can see that the membrane is oscillating like this. The mass and the outer membranes are going in opposite directions. Now, there's a reason for that. That is because if they offer it directions like that, the effective acceleration is zero because half is going plus and half is going minus. And so when you calculate the effective mass, it goes to infinity. And that's that point here. But actually, we're, we're not at infinity. We're at about 20 times, as I told you, the mass of the actually it's epoxy we stick in the center here. OK, so now I've told you about that. I promise always to tell you the intuitive mechanism. You just put air and water, you get 100% reflected. So I'm going to now insert my effective mass element. And look, there's an effectively um, wave. There's a real wave generated with 180 degrees phase difference. I'll just do that again. You put in your melt element. The second reflective wave cancels out the reflection and it's just emits also in the opposite direction, so it's transmitted. So it's identical to the previous case. It's a phase shifting reflector and a forward emitter. That's all. OK, so we design our meta atom. Uh, we need a cavity about five millimeters, which is a hundredth of the wavelength. The wavelength is 490 millimeters in air or two meters in water. And at this magic frequency of 707 hertz, we calculate that there is, in the case of no losses, that there is perfect transmission. OK, there will be losses. OK, but let's do the experiment first. So we use hydrophones and steel, a steel tube, very thick to avoid lateral um, displacements. Hydrophones here and a microphone here. And we're going to measure the transmission through this system, which is full of, full of water here. And there's a vibrator to generate the waves. And what we find is that on resonance, without a meta service, nothing is transmitted very much. Less than, well, we, we know how much is transmitted. It's 0.05%. Okay, there might be some noise which makes it bigger here. But the important thing is what is transmitted on resonance, on, on sorry, on matching conditions. On the matching condition, 30% is transmitted. In other words, an enhancement of 600 times. So this really works in experiment. And why doesn't it work to 100%? Because there's residual damping and dissipation from the meta atom. And the guys who did most of their work are here. There's a um, um, postdoc in my group and Professor Sam Hyung Lee. And by the way, this is the impedance termination that's coming out of that that um, experiment and it ends with a, a cone of porous paper and Un did a lot of um, theory for this as well so he's holding his theory here as well very precious and uh, yeah so uh, the last topic in this part of the talk is how about the meta surface I mean I've just shown you a meta atom but I want to show a meta surface and uh, you can put a lot of atoms together and make a surface and you can calculate again using uh, this time finite element analysis. Analytically, it's a bit tricky because the frame is wobbling. Remember now, you can't hold the frame infinitely rigidly because it's kind of surface has to be placed on the water freely. And so there's a center of mass problem. So if the membranes go up, the frame has to go down. And so it shifts a bit the frequency, it makes it a bit higher frequency, in fact, uh, for 743. And you can see a nice animation here with the meta surface from water to air beautiful uh yeah wait a minute let me make sure i'm not going to make a mistake yeah beautifully transmitted and bare interface almost nothing transmitted and uh this is the picture of the center of mass well showing you how the membrane is vibrating like in antiphase the center and the outside membranes. I might just add this is the possibility for the design of a of an impedance matched uh, air water system but this is quite a robust and 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 uh, and the membrane is divided into five parts so it's actually less easy to break the membrane compared to a, a big one with a, with just a single mass and a single membrane although you could do it as well in that case by by choosing the right mode. OK, so it brings me to the last topic and uh, which I can go through very quickly. 
And uh, that is a perfect band gap acoustic meta, meta beam and meta rod. So you're all familiar with beams and rods. Here are some examples. And um, okay, so how do they transmit waves? So there are four different modes in a rod in general, compressional, torsional, shear horizontal and shear vertical. You see this one's horizontal and this one's vertical. This is, these two are both flexural waves, of course, both of them. I should have put flexural here as well, but anyway. And uh, what about how to, to prevent vibrations traveling on, along, a, along a material, a solid material? Well, lots of people sell vibration isolators, but they're all very much based on these, you know, uh, viscoelastic materials and uh, de heavily damped. So you could have a fiberglass damper. Some examples are given here. And, um, but recently attention has been drawn towards the possibility of using metamaterials. And, um, well, myself and Vitaly Gousseff from Le Mans University in France um, proposed theoretically flexural metamaterials. And then this was realized quite soon after. Here's one example of, um, of uh, the group from Changsha National University of Defense. They used uh, an acrylic rod with membranes embedded and they found a band gap in the region of, of uh, 25 of 2.5 kilohertz. And then here's another example. And this is an example from Hong Kong Polytechnic. They have a steel rod here with funny holes in it. This actually has a very nice broadband uh, damping of, of, um, of flexural modes. And this is from the group from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, where they managed to damp two different types of modes, flexural and torsional, using, again, the similar uh, steel silicone epoxy geometry. But nobody until uh, uh, around that time had thought of having to block all possible modes in a solid structure, in a solid rod. So that's where, where we come in. And this is our meta beam, which looks a bit like a Space Invader from Space Invaders game. And it's uh, so complicated because it has to block four different modes. So it's made of aluminium. It's eight millimeters thick and it's 80, 80 millimeters wide. And you can see what shape it is here. And uh, we simulate it first with Comsol Multiphysics. And this was Ken Tauro, Fujita and Motonobu Tomoda from my group who really contributed to getting this work done. And firstly, the secret is to try so many different geometries until you hit on one where all the unit cells modes have the roughly the same frequency. So you have to keep searching to make four frequencies the same. Four different frequencies have to be the same. So it's a question of perseverance, changing the geometry, changing the geometry, checking the mode frequency. OK, I'll show you two modes here. Compressional mode. OK, this is a unit cell and torsional mode. Here we managed to get them both in the region of one kilohertz. OK, this is the strain energy density. The parts that glow red are the parts that are being strained. So they're the springs. The parts that glow blue, this is the kinetic energy density, are the parts that are moving. So this corresponds to the moving mass. So in each case, the position of the spring is different according to the mode. So There's a nice way to bring out what is spring and what is mass. OK, two of the modes, fine. Not far off one kilohertz. How about the other two modes? These are the in-plane shear. And you can see shear horizontal, we can call it, sorry. And we can call, uh, we can see that it's also one, nearly one kilohertz. And this is out of plane shear, shear vertical, we can call it. And amazingly, this is also one kilohertz. So having found all these modes at one kilohertz, you think, OK, I'm going to join together a lot of unit cells. Well, we're going to do periodic boundary conditions and we're going to see, have we got a nice dispersion relation? Indeed, we do. We have a dispersion relation with a perfect band gap between about 0.97 kilohertz and 1.09 kilohertz. So it has a perfect band gap. And this was the first example of a material that actually showed this property. So we have to build it and see if it really works. And actually, it looks a bit like this. Um, I've got one here. I've got it here, the thing in front of me. 
Now, I know Zoom filters out resonances because you're not supposed to hear your own voice. So I don't think you'll be able to hear it ring very well, but it has a beautiful ring to it. It could make a metamaterial, you know, xylophone or whatever. It's really nice. So that's what it looks like. And you hang it up with fishing line and you put a piezoelectric excitation on one end and you put accelerometers at the other end and you can excite according to the position of your piezos all four modes and detect the ratio of the amplitudes at the two ends, okay? The, the ones that count, of course, because if you're doing torsion, you have to get the right two accelerations to get the twist. But anyway, you do all that and then you can find the output-input ratio in dB as a function of frequency for all different modes. And I put here in gray the position where we expect the band gap to be from COMSOL simulations, and this is experimental result. So in all cases, you get a very nice dip. You get a very nice dip in the, in the position where you want to get the nice dip. And just to give you some quantitative thoughts, the input-output ratio takes a value less than 0.5 between 1.02 and 1.16 kilohertz, which is in reasonable correspondence with the perfect band gap. And not only that, at one kilohertz, then the propagation against 10 unit cells is sufficient to damp out the acoustic wave by a factor of 50. So there really is, I believe, a perfect acoustic band gap there. Maybe not as wide as the one in, in Comsol, but it's pretty good. So you can do it with the decay constant if you want, and the same thing. And uh, so, okay, what's the problem with the meta beam? It's really high aspect ratio, and uh, it's not so convenient. It's not so convenient for, well, yeah, applications. It's very thin and it could bend, you know. So you really want a sturdy rod. You don't really want this thin meta beam, even though it looks so beautiful and quite easy to make because you can just machine it out like that easily. But anyway, the question was, could we make a meta rod? And the answer is yes. And this was thanks to my student, uh, master student Akira Ogosawara, and again, Motonobu Tomoda, for persevering and finding by iterative design what it takes to make a meta rod. And this is an acrylic meta rod of diameter 50 millimeters and it's made by assembly. So you just ask the workshop to make you some parts like this, some stars, some rods. And here you can see them in a cylinder, two other cylinders, two Y-shaped plates, and the whole thing fits inside a tube. And you use like dichloroethylene, or whatever it's called, dichloroethylene, to glue them together. You can make your meta roll. And again, I'll show you the kinetic energy density and the strain energy density for the, for the uh, longitudinal mode, flexural mode, and torsional mode. And you arrange all these unit cell resonances to be very similar. And then you get, when you string them all together, you get another perfect band gap. And this time it's even better than before in terms of, you know, the percentage of band gap to band gap central frequency. It's actually pretty good. It's almost 20% of the, the frequency of the center of the band gap. So it's a nice, perfect band gap. And again, we make this thing, and as you might expect, I've got, I've got it here, I've got it here, and it's, whoops, it's very, very, um, quite big, quite a big object, yeah, like this. Can you see that? And uh, I'm not sure what it's good for. I mean, looks a bit like a telescope, but anyway, so this is it, and I'm sure you're hoping I'm going to clout it with this uh, hammer I've got. I'm afraid you're going to be bitterly disappointed because it's heavily damp because it's made of acrylic. So this, this metal rod is not going to ring like a bell like the other one does. So I'm not going to propose it as a musical instrument. But anyway, um, you see on the screen how we attach the piezo discs, the accelerometers, and uh, do the same experiment as before. It doesn't work quite as well. It doesn't work quite as well. But in the gap region, there's a, a net decrease in the logarithmic um, amplitude, okay? So let me say quantitatively, the output-input intensity ratio for all modes takes a value less than 0.25, which is 6 dB, 
between 800 and 980 hertz. So that's definitely a sign of the band gap, okay? All right, it's not as good as the other one because it's heavily damped. The discussion whether damping is better in the end than these resonant metal materials. Okay, so one last slide. If you want to, this is what you do when you're trying to design these things. You vary some parameter and you see the perfect band gap. You see the band gap and you see how to optimize it. So here I'm thinking of changing the resonator spacing, which is the, the vertical axis, and seeing how the band gap changes, which is the colored region. So this is the total band gap, the perfect band gap, and these are the three modes, compressional, frextral, and torsional. And lo and behold, if you change the resonator spacing, nothing changes. This is good because it approves it's not a phononic crystal. It proves it's a metamaterial because phononic crystal's resonance depends on Bragg condition, which changes with the unit cell size, but this one doesn't. So it's definitely a metamaterial. So people should always do this as a check if, they are, if they're in doubt. But the other thing you can change is the thickness, for example, of the outer tube. And if you do that, you can find it does really change the perfect band gap. So if the tube is varied from the outer tube from 0.5 to 3.5 millimeters, the best one is around 1.5 millimeters, but they don't sell that one. They sell two millimeters. So we had to put up with not quite the best one. But anyway, the point was just to show it had a band gap. Okay, so um, about what I said at the very beginning of the talk, the magic, where's the magic? The magic would be a coffee table made with metamaterial legs. And you noticed I put a taper on the leg because I want multiple oscillator frequencies in there to damp out as many as waves as possible. And there's another thing. I don't want to fool you too much, but think about this. My band gap was at one kilohertz. If I'm going to use the same, I got it here, the same metamaterial structure for my co coffee table legs, I'm going to have to multiply the dimensions of this thing by 1,000. I say it with a slight embarrassed tone, which means the very sorry to say, but the coffee table leg diameter will be 50 meters. So it's totally stupid, isn't it? Okay, so to mitigate this terrible criticism of 50 meter wide coffee table legs, I propose to very much thin down the bottom rod here and re eliminate the top rod. You could make this rod out of steel and the, you could make the connecting rod out of rubber if you wanted or something. Well, it wouldn't work with rubber because it wouldn't be resonant then. It would damp too much. Anyway, please somebody make, whoops, my joke. Please somebody make this table work. Okay, but there's one thing I have to tell you if you're going to make this meta table, registered trademark meta table. You may have registered the trademark. Unfortunately, the disadvantage is metatable.com is already taken. I tried and it was taken. So somebody's selling table linens on metatable.com, so it's not going to be very useful if you're going to make a company to make meta tables. Okay, so I want to conclude by saying that extraordinary acoustic transmission could lead to new devices and microscopies. And I didn't mention to you, but these guys on the boat sometimes have to call to the divers to come up quickly. If one diver is injured and they bring him up, they have to bring all the other divers back. And the way they do it now is by banging on the bottom of the boat. It's the only way. But if they had a meta surface on the water, I mean, they could call to the divers and say, come back. Okay? So, not just meta surface lead to new detectors for under sound, but perhaps a, may, a way of calling to divers. Okay, also solid solid systems ex exhibit extraordinary transmission. There may be, may be some applications in sensing. And finally, if you can get the coffee table to work, it would be great. So, I would like to conclude. And um, so what does our wizard, our wizard who's been accompanying us throughout this talk, what does our wizard have to say about this? Okay, obviously, what he's going to say is metabra kadabra. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you so much, Oliver, for this uh, wonderful talk. I'm sure there will be many, many questions from the audience. So, uh, please, people, you are more, more than welcome to come up with your uh, questions. Now is the right time for questions. I've got many.